I'm Pastor Nev and we're together to partake of communion or share communion together today. And each day I've been sharing with you and we've been teaching through the Word of God and I was reminded this morning that this is a season where Jesus encouraged his disciples to remain vigilant, to continue in the Word of God. And so I want to go to the book of Acts chapter 1 and you can see how Jesus spoke to his disciples if you have your bibles with you in acts chapter one and we see that the writing there jesus writes uh from verse one it says the former theses theses i have made of theophilus theophilus to all that jesus began both to do and teach so let's pray that together this morning jesus you'll notice when you get to the scripture jesus did two things he didn't just speak he said he spoke and he did now father today we thank you that we are a speaking doing church that we have a commission from you not only to reach the world but to preach the gospel to each and every one so that men and women might know you and the power of your spirit in jesus name amen if you remember i touched briefly on the book of ephesians and we'll go and look a little more there today. But in Ephesians, how the Bible says he predetermined us, he blessed us, he chose us, he ordained us before the foundation of the earth. And God's primary purpose, as I told you in Hebrews chapter 13, the last verse of Hebrews 13, around about verse 22, it says that you might be perfected through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, after Calvary, Jesus meets with his disciples and he has a conversation with them and he's instructing them of what they need to do while he is gone. And this is where the book of Acts begins. So we notice that firstly, they're reminded that Jesus in verse one is not just a teacher, but also a doer of the word until he was taken up after that. He through the Holy Ghost gave commandments unto the apostles to who he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs i want you to know that the resurrection of jesus had to have proof not only was there proof that the soldiers were paid to keep their mouth shut not only is there proof that only 500 rose from the dead but he met with his 12 disciples men who knew him surely they didn't mistake him or misunderstand him but they were men who knew him and understood him and so the Bible says there were many infallible proofs and they were seen of him for 40 days. This is really significant. Now, this wouldn't be important if Jesus was dead, had been raised from the dead. Three days later, he's raised from the dead. But here the Bible says he was seen of them in verse 3 for 40 days and he spoke of things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which said he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. So here's Jesus meeting with his disciples and he's inspiring his disciples to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, many will say, well, surely when I get born again, I received the Holy Ghost. Well, you will notice that the ministry of Jesus begins in the power of the Spirit. After the temptation, where he's tempted by the devil, and uh, it's been a number of days where Jesus himself has been uh, on the mountain without food, without water, and when he comes down from the mountain, the Bible says he comes in the power of the Spirit and his fame goes abroad. And Jesus knew the power of the Spirit was important. And in John chapter 20, verse 20, after his resurrection, you'll see the Bible tells us that Jesus, when he meets with his disciples, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. You'll notice, uh, let's read verse 19. It says the same day at evening, this is after Jesus is risen from the dead, being the first day of the week, which means it was a Sunday, 
When the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst. I'm reading John chapter 20, verse 29. And said unto them, Peace be unto you. Oh, always remember that whenever Jesus meets, it's always fear not, peace be unto you, I'm with you, you're going to be okay. And when he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side. Then, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus unto them, again, peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive the Holy Spirit. So here you'll see in John chapter 20, verse 20, Jesus has said to his disciples, Receive the Holy Spirit. This is after his resurrection. Now we're talking about the outpouring of the Spirit that he tells them to go and wait for in the book of Acts. So therefore there was more than what they just received in the upper room. And notice he says this after he says, receive the Spirit. Really what is taking place at this point in time is they are becoming born again believers. Because up until this time, until John 20, 20, up until after the resurrection, you could not be born again because you were living under the law and the prophets. Did you remember that Jesus has said to Nicodemus in chapter four of the book of John, he said, uh, when, Nic when Nicodemus comes to see him at night, and Nicodemus is a teacher, he says, Master, what good thing must I do uh, to, to be saved? And Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus, being a highly intelligent man, said, what are you, you talking about? I, I can't be born again. How can I, as an old man, enter into my mother's room and be born again? And Jesus said to him, what is born of the flesh is flesh. And what is born of the Spirit is Spirit. You must be born again. And so when people say, are oh, you one of those born againers? Well, you could say, yes, I am. Really what you've said is I've entered into this new life with the Lord Jesus Christ. I've accepted him. Now, John 20, 20, Jesus breathes unto his disciples. Why would this be significant? Well, in the book of Genesis, after God forms Adam and Eve, he breathes into him the breath of life. And when you receive Jesus, he breathes into you the breath of a new life. The breath of life that is in him, he breathes it into you and you become a child. So the first thing that happens when you get born again is there is an inner knowing. There is an outbreathing of God and an inbreathing into your spirit, which assures you that your life has been given to the Lord. The next verse is important. Remember, we were in John chapter 20, verse 20, he breathes on them. And then it continues to say, Then Jesus said to them, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, verse 22, and said to them, Receive thou the Holy Spirit, whoever sins, you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whoever sins you retain, they are retained. So here he says to the disciples, you will have the ability to lead people to a place where their sins can be forgiven. And you'll be able to give them an assurance that their sin is forgiven and it will never ever come back into their life. So now Jesus has this conversation with them. Now there's always one unbeliever and you can read in the rest of the chapter where Thomas is an unbeliever, verse 24, but Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when they saw Jesus. And the other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. But they said unto him, except I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger in the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Isn't it strange that there are those who've seen and experience the miracle power of God. You've received the miracle power of God, but there's always someone who says, unless Jesus appears to me personally. And God in his graciousness and his mercy is going to appear to Thomas. But he's going to say something significant to him, which is significant to you and I. 
It says, and after eight days again, so this is a week later, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them came, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, and the doors being shut, and stood in the middle of them, and said, Peace be unto you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach out your finger, and behold my hands, and reach your, out your hand, and thrust your hand into my side, and be not faithless, but believe. You remember we went through the book of Hebrews. One of the key scriptures in Hebrews is have faith in God. And the Bible says, be not faithless. You see, when we're faithless, our mindset is, if I see it, I'll believe it. But what faith says is, I'll believe it and I'll see it. And that believing is not just wishful thinking. It is a believing in the heart because God has breathed into us his salvation. There is a greater one that lives within you. And with Jesus, the greater one living within you, he puts within you a desire. And that desire will always be the will of God. And if you're not sure of your desire, you can check it against the word of God. It's a good desire to want people healed. It's a good desire to want your family to be born again. It's a good desire to want your business to prosper. It's a good desire to want to succeed at an enterprise. Those are not evil things. They are good desires. And the Bible is clear. Be not faithless. Only believe. Then notice Thomas's response, which is in verse 28. Then Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. Jesus says something pivotal that applies to you and I. Then Jesus said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you believe. Blessed are those that have not seen yet believe. I want you to know there is an extra blessing to those who have not seen yet believe. God, Jesus had breathed on his disciples. But Thomas said, that's not enough for me. I want to put my fingers into the hole in your hands. I want to put my hand into the hole in your side. I want proof that you are savior. And Jesus said, the empty cross is enough. The empty tomb is enough. How much more evidence do you need? The tomb is empty. The women have been to the tomb. The disciples have been to the tomb. Jesus is gonna be alive for 40 days. 500 other graves are being opened. But Thomas said, no, I need it proved to me. And then Jesus in his graciousness and his mercy and his love proved himself to Thomas. But he made a pertinent statement. He said, blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. And many times in our prayer life, this is where we struggle so much. And I want to encourage you, just because you don't see the tangible evidence of something does not mean it does not exist. Of course, we're going to have communion and I have the chalice and I have the basket for the bread and I can see them and I can touch them. And you through the camera can virtually see them, but you cannot touch or feel them because you're seeing them through virtual reality and so I can tell you they're real I can tell you that this is glass and you have to believe my word someone could say it's plastic no it's glass I could tell you that this is real silver and you could say oh, oh no that isn't plastic it's just fake but I could tell you it's real I could tell you it's an antique piece and you'd say all you would have is my word and then you would say, you know, I know Pastor Nev wouldn't lie to, to me. So if he says this is antique silver, it is. If he says it's glass, it is. I don't need to see it and touch it and feel it. I just need to be able to receive the word. Now, when you receive a word, for me to speak means there is an out breathing. And for you to listen, you are receiving what I am saying. And so the words that I speak, have no barrier. They transmit through the atmosphere all the way into your home, into your living room, wherever you are today. God's word comes to you. God's word comes to your physical body. God's word comes to your finance. Those words cannot be trapped into a building or a facility. God's word cannot be trapped anywhere. It is transported right to the place where you are. And that's why the scripture says his word will never return to him void or empty. 
once you put his word out there, it will go and accomplish what it was called to accomplish. So here's Thomas, who doesn't believe in Jesus as the firstborn from the dead. And he's going to say to Thomas, Thomas, now you have all and every good reason to believe. Now it's interesting, and I, I really want to get to teaching you on the outpouring of the Spirit. But it's interesting because immediately in this next chapter, you will see it says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples. So you'll begin to see that there are multiple appearances of Jesus and he is still performing miracles because it's in chapter 21, verse 5, Jesus says to them, do you have any meat? Now, the disciples are out fishing and they said that, no, we've caught nothing. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you shall fill. And they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw in for the multitude of fishes. Jesus is still working miracles. Just because he'd been crucified didn't change the fact he was the miracle worker. But in order for the disciples to believe, he gave them the greatest fishing experience they would ever have. Now remember, he'd called them away from their businesses. So when he said, come follow me, they'd followed him for three and a half years. And when he dies, Peter says, I'm going fishing. Now he wants them to realize that he's called them to be more than just a good businessman, a good fisherman, to come from a family. And some of the disciples of Jesus is thought that John's family owned silver mines. He, he wanted them to realize there was more than the family business. He wanted them to realize that his business was to bring men and women into the kingdom of God. So he needed to give them an example. And the greatest example he could give them was to fill their nets to overflow. Now, when you read the rest of the passage, by the time they arrive at shore, Jesus has already prepared breakfast for them. For them and uh, they were a little bit afraid to ask him, well, where did you get the breakfast from? But the point of all of this is to bear in mind that he is alive. He met with his disciples multiple times. He performed miracles after his resurrection. And now he's going to instruct them in Acts chapter 1 to go and wait for a greater outpouring of the Spirit. That's what I began with this morning. That they're firstly reminded, they're firstly reminded that after his passion, that Jesus did and taught and ministered to multitudes. Now, when you go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 4, it says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. For John truly baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. Now, isn't this amazing? He breathes into them. In John 20, 22, and they receive the Spirit. Then they have this great fishing experience with him, where their nets break, and their businesses have been closed for three years. Now Jesus tells them, I want you to go and wait in Jerusalem because there's more. I want you to know there's always more. There's always more. We might think it's all over. It's clear when you read John 20, they were hiding. If they were hiding, it means they weren't fishing. If they were hiding, it means they weren't generating an income. If they were hiding, it means they were expecting to be arrested or something to go wrong at any point in time. But in the middle of this experience, Jesus appears to them. Then eight days later in John 20, he appears again and he appears for Thomas so that Thomas can believe. Then the very next chapter, and that's in John 21, they go fishing and he to them is a stranger. Now, you would wonder why, is, why would Jesus be a stranger? How would it be that they didn't recognize Jesus? Well, if you remember, the Bible says he would be wounded and he would be marred 
than any human being. So his countenance was more than likely changed by the whipping. His body was changed by the whipping and the laceration. Because even after he healed up and stopped bleeding, his face would have been left deformed, his hands deformed, his side deformed. He wouldn't have appeared as the Jesus they knew. And so it appears that Jesus was unrecognizable. And the scripture says there is no beauty in him when we see him, no natural beauty that we would want to pursue him. And he has given his back to the, to the whipping block, given his hands to the cross, given his feet to the cross. He appears to his disciples, but they see him in a miracle. And it's interesting that he multiplies loaves and fishes and then tells him, I want you to be fishes of men. And I want to tell you, this is a season of multiplication. You're believing God and saying, God, I need you to multiply, multiply everything in my house whether it's your bread, whether it's your meal, whether it's your finance, whatever it is, you say, precious heavenly father, I need you to multiply strength to me, to give me a miracle of this season. And I believe God is doing that today, right now. We're going to continue, but heavenly father, I thank you. That where there are doubts in our hearts, many of us feel like Thomas at times, we thank you that you just show us how deep and rich your love is for us. We thank you that even in the middle of this season, where we say we fished all night and caught nothing, we're doing what we can to generate an income, but it doesn't seem to be working. I thank you that you appear in the middle of our efforts and you multiply, you give us a boat loading draft of fish. You give us a bank filling, a house filling, a refrigerator filling. You fill our hearts, not only in the natural, but you fill every area of lack that the season has caused. And I thank you for it. Now let's continue in the scripture. As you continue in the scripture, you'll notice that after they, they caught the fish, of course, they bring them to Jesus. And Jesus already had food to eat. And I'm not going to continue with that chapter but you will see when we get to the book of acts the disciples are together which i started off with this morning and in acts 1 verse 4 they're assembled together in other words they're having church and part of our appeal is for us to be able to gather as a church i hear all the time on on media and it never stops every single politician says the church the church in korea the church here the church there i do not hear that when i say the government of build buildings the people in elevators the people in the back of building trucks people crammed together in informal settlements i just hear the church it comes out of the political leaders mouths so flippantly and they don't seem to realize that the church is their greatest ally when there are poor and needy who takes care of them when there are sick in hospital who visits them when there are those who want to get married, who marries them? When they are dead, who buries them? When they are in need of counsel because they're about to commit suicide, who counsels them? When there are marriage problems or a child is being beaten, who takes care of that? Surely the church is essential and us gathering together is essential. But let's move a little bit further here. In the book of Acts, he said, stay in Jerusalem. And so right now, as you're staying indoors, it's a good time to be mindful of what God wants to do and wait for the promise of the Father that you've heard of me. What is he saying to him? John truly baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. Now, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, John the Baptist, John the Baptist, he was baptized in the River Jordan. And there are not three drops of water in the River Jordan. And you'll read very clearly as we get further and touch on some other scriptures, maybe in the book of Acts, that they went down into the water and came up out of the water. So there was a substantial amount of water. It would be impossible for me to baptize myself in this glass. The Jewish people understood a baptism called a mitzvah. They would get into a container and submerge themselves under water, come out of the water. Now, what was the significance? 
The significance was they were leaving their old life behind and were picking up their new life. Jesus says that the Holy Spirit is going to come on you and completely overwhelm you with his presence. And he's telling them, go and wait for this experience. Verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time again restore the kingdom? An interesting question. They still hadn't lost their political aspirations. Their mindset is politically, is this the time now when you will overthrow Rome? And right now, one of the questions I'm being asked the most, is this the end of the age? Well, we're definitely living in a season that if this lockdown continues and if they try and push it till the end of July, they will endeavor to push it so that your money will be worth nothing and force you towards a digital currency. There's definitely a motivation to force and to herd people into that situation. There's definitely a situation for world government or the World Health Organization. And uh, the World Health Organization, half of its money comes from Bill Gates. And Bill Gates has got nothing to do with health but with computers. But he is now a self-proclaimed pharmacist and healer. And uh, he's given half the money to the World Health Organization. So you better believe he's bought and paid for the World Health Organization. And he is the one producing the vaccines. And uh, of course, uh, you can go and uh, look up online who he is and what he does and uh, research his background. But what we're looking at is we're looking at a time and a season where there are a few that want to control more and more of the world. They want to control your health, they want to control your wealth, and they want to control you. And so health and wealth are two of the most powerful things. So you'll find that according to scripture, the Antichrist endeavors to control wealth. And then he endeavors to control health. And then the scripture tells us that you won't be able to buy or sell unless you fall into lockstep with what government asks you to do. And the scripture says that we're not to go there or receive that mark. But because I'm not teaching on end times today, I want you to see what is going to happen and will happen in the end times and what Jesus is doing by his spirit. Notice the disciples had the same question. Is this the end of the age for the Roman government? And Jesus wouldn't answer them. And he said to him, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons within which the Father has put in his own power. You see, Jesus doesn't even know the exact time he's coming back. The only one who knows the exact moment of the return of Jesus is the Father himself. But he did tell us in Scripture, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and famine and nation against nation, look up because your redemption draws nigh. You're getting close to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said to them, don't you worry about times and seasons. What you need to focus on is verse 8. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you will be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Notice what Jesus' answer was to their political question. You shall receive power. What we need now in this hour is the power to live a godly, spiritual, miraculous life. You shall receive power. And you and I are in a place right now where we say, Father, then fill me with your power. Give me your power. Give me the power to be able to speak wisely, power to pray and see supernatural things take place, the power to alter circumstances and situations, the power to possess every promise. This is what Jesus said. He said, if you'll wait, you will receive power. And we know they do receive this power. And then the Bible says they turn the world upside down. And verse 9 says, And when he'd spoken these things, while they beheld him, he was taken up in a cloud and received out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by him in white apparel. Oh, here are the angels again. They're there with you. And notice, they asked him a question. 
And they, they said to, and which said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go. You saw him go up in the clouds. You'll see him come back in the same manner. He is coming back. But in between, he said to the disciples, I'm going, you'll receive power. And you'll function in that power. You will operate in that power until I return. And so now we know that the disciples go and they gather in the upper room. And the upper room is a wonderful place. We've I've been into it and it's a, a room and my guess is it's maybe 15 meters by 15. Maybe a little bit bigger. Let's say a 20 by 20 room. But it, it can take maybe... 100 to 200 people comfortably, reasonably comfortably. It says that upper room, or we're mindful in that upper room, it's the same room where Jesus took the Last Supper. And what a wonderful thing. And uh, we've, we've already planning to go to Israel now, 2020 or 2021. We're planning to go to Israel. And one of my favorite experiences is that upper room because it's in that upper room that we'll get together and sing that wonderful little chorus that people sing. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And as we all sing together in that upper room, it's just an amazing experience. But the Bible tells me that Jesus had given his disciples a promise that they would receive power. Then he's taken up. Visually, they see him go. And visually, we will see him come. And he said to them, now you wait here until you receive power. So they're in the upper room and they are waiting. And they are waiting for a prescribed time. Now remember the scripture said, Jesus showed himself alive for 40 days after his resurrection. Well, Pentecost is 50. That is the next Jewish feast after Calvary. And so the Bible says in Acts chapter two, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly they ca there came from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, a sound as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as fire, and sat on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem devout men out of every nation under heaven now when this was noised abroad the multitude came together and was confirmed confounded for they heard every man them speak in his language and they were all amazed and marveled saying one to another behold are they not all galileans and now hear we every man his own tongue where he is he is born they hearing the gospel being preached Verse 12 says, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what does this mean? And others mocked and said, these men are full of new wine. Verse 14, but Peter standing up with the 11, lifted up his voice and said to them, you men of Judah and all you that live in Jerusalem, be it known to you and listen to my words. These are not drunk as you suppose, because it is the third hour, it's nine o'clock in the morning, but this is what was prophesied by the prophet Job. It shall come to pass in the last days. So here the disciples receive the initial outpouring of the spirit. This was the beginning of the last days. And the last days would begin to unfold and we would begin to move from that day of Pentecost towards the second coming of Jesus. These days are prophesied by the prophet Joel. It'll come to pass in the last days. These are the things God will do. And this is what he wants to do in your home and your life. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. God wants to fill you with his power, with his presence. He wants you to know that he is real. And he tells you how you'll experience that outpouring. It says your son's and daughters shall prophesy. And that doesn't mean they're going to point their finger and say, thus saith the Lord. 
but they will hear from heaven no things that are to come. Your young men shall see visions. You go to sleep at night and God will speak to you. Remember, we talked about angels. It's a time to have visions, not just to be a visionary, but to have a vision of what God is doing on earth. And your old men will dream dreams. Now, a vision is with your eyes open, a dream with your eyes closed. But in other words, you'll have God encounters. I'm believing that you're going to have God encounters in your home. Your sons and daughters are going to have God encounters in your workplace. You're going to have God encounters that you're just going to be sitting there on your chair. Suddenly you're going to see, feel the presence of God come over you. And he's going to speak clearly to your heart, strengthening you, giving you direction, putting creative ideas in your heart and in your mind. It says, and your young men will see vision, your old men dream dreams, and on your servants and your handmaids, even those who work for you, I will pour out of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in the heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, and vaporous smoke, and the sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, and we've seen a number of blood moons over these past few years, before that great and notable day of the Lord's coming and it will come to pass that whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved here in the middle of this great outpouring and it's just like Jesus whenever there's a great move of the spirit he talks about what will happen at the end of the age and he always gives you a comparison he said there will be a people who are filled with my power who will pray with a prayer language and will prophesy, who will have visions, who will have dreams. They'll be on the cutting edge. They will see the future and know the future long before they get to the future. They will know what the Lord has in store and has in plan so they can divinely structure their lives. They can put, as we would put all their ducks in a row and organize themselves because they've heard from God. They've heard through the preaching of the word. They know what the scripture says. They're aware that Jesus is returning and they're aware that the earth becomes darker and darker, but the believers become lighter and lighter. So we're living in a comparative world right now where, wicked, where the wicked are becoming more wicked and the righteous are pressing into a greater right relationship with God. So what we're beginning to see on the earth is unprecedented wickedness. On the one hand, we're seeing, and the reason I have these little children on my table, and I'll bring one a little closer, is because I have grandchildren. How horrific is it to take a child and to take that child and use, abort it and use its body parts for medicine and uh, replacement organs and all the rest of it. And uh, some of what's in that baby is in a vaccine. How horrendous is that? The Bible said the wicked would become more wicked in the state of New York. A little baby, little baby can be kept alive for a week after it's born. And then uh, you can suddenly decide to put it to death. That's wicked. That is wicked. The Bible says you're going to see extreme wickedness on one side. But on the other side, you're going to see extreme goodness. we are going to see the righteous arise and the righteous begin to determine the future. Like Daniels, the righteous will arise in the courts of the king and say, this is what shall be done. Just like Joseph in the court of Pharaoh, in a time where there was no provision, they were able to say there'll be provision. And I don't want to leave any of you thinking, oh, Pastor Nev, you gave me this terrible image of a child, but Moses also should have been massacred and destroyed as a baby. But someone hid that little baby in an ark and he became a leader. And I want you to know right now that God sees every little child and he hides them in the ark of his presence. That the power of the spirit that is in you, that is in the earth, is actually holding back the complete wickedness that the devil would want to belch out on the earth. In fact, the Bible says, once we're gone and the Holy Spirit is gone, the world will behave in the most atrocious way. 
But right now it says the Holy Spirit is the restrainer. And he's restraining wickedness on earth. He's restraining people from doing what is unrighteous. Don't be like a doubting Thomas. Be like one of the other disciples who said, I've seen Jesus. I know Jesus. Thomas had to be in a place where he had to touch and feel the miracle worker and see Jesus. And yet Jesus said to him, blessed are those who have not seen and believe. And then he promptly went and gave them a miracle of multiplication. And then the very next book is the book of Acts, where he said, wait. I want to encourage you today to wait till you are empowered with the Spirit. Because it is the empowering of the Spirit that will open visions and dreams and godly plans and purposes to you. And as you're joining me today, you say, Pastor Neff, I've never received the Holy Spirit. Well, the word Spirit comes from the word breath or pneuma. You remember Jesus with his disciples after he was raised, he breathed on his disciples. What was he doing? He was just breathing new life. God, when he creates Adam and Eve in the earth and he molds them out of the dust of the earth, he breathes on them. They become living beings. Then we find in the book of Acts chapter 2, the Bible says there was the sound of a mighty rushing wind. That means there was an out-breathing from heaven. And it was an out-breathing during a time of great fear. It was an out-breathing when the disciples were afraid that the Roman government would put them to death. It was an out-breathing where they were hiding in one upper room, 120 of them, for fear, the Bible says, of the Jews and the Romans. But that out-breathing of the power of the Spirit shook that whole town of Jerusalem. And suddenly the doors that they were hiding in, the doors flew open. They came out praising God, speaking a heavenly language, singing a heavenly language. And from that day on, they walked completely unafraid in the face of opposition and persecution and torment. They walked out free that day. They didn't stay in that upper room. The doors flung open, they walked out, and they began to declare the Lordship of Jesus. And we have this wonderful opportunity, while people are so afraid, to declare He is risen. He's shown Himself by many infallible proofs. You're one of those proofs because you've given your life to Jesus, and He lives in your heart and life. And as you share your testimony, what God has done for you and how He's changed you, so others will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Now today we're going to come to the table of the Lord. And as we come to the table of the Lord, I'm mindful that when Jesus had been raised from the dead and he's on the road to Emmaus and he's visiting with the disciples, the disciples don't recognize him. And then they invite him into the house. When they invite him into the house as culture just would be culturally you would eat together this is a guest you would prepare for the guest and the disciples still didn't recognize him when he came into the house but then the bible says they knew him in the breaking of the bread we're not told that this meal was communion it could have been but they knew him in the breaking of the bread jesus must have had a way that he broke the bread he broke the bread a certain way at the Passover meal. And today as you partake of the bread and wherever you are, I invite you to join me regardless of what your church background is. Say, Pastor Neva, I believe Jesus loves me, died for me, shed his blood for me. I've given him my life. He is my Lord and my Savior. Then the Bible says we all partake of the same table. God has one family of believers and you're part of that family. So I want to invite you to join me in communion today. And we're going to partake of the bread and we're going to partake of the wine together. Father, I thank you. Your word says the night in which you were betrayed, you took the bread and you broke it. You said, this is your body, which is broken for us. And we thank you that just like it was said, the disciples knew you in the breaking of bread. So each time we have communion together, we get to know you in a deeper and a more real way. 
as a very real Jesus that cares for us to the degree that you specially appeared so that Thomas could put his finger into your hand and his hand into your side so that the disciples would see one last great miracle where fish would be dragged in more than they could ever hold. We thank you that this is a season where this last harvest is the greatest harvest we ever have in our life because it's a harvest commanded by you. So as we eat of this bread today, we thank you that you bless each and every life. You bless our homes, you bless our children, you bless our families, you bless our businesses, you bless the work of our hands, in Jesus' name, amen. We thank you, Father, for your broken body. Take and eat of it. The scripture says, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Take and drink of it. Now, before we close, I've touched a little and we'll go a little bit further on talking about the mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God. And once you've acknowledged Jesus as your Lord to save Savior, He's breathed of his eternal life into you. But there's more. There's the power of the Spirit. And the power of the Spirit is not just your ability to pray in a prayer language. That prayer language is the tongue of men and of angels, according to Scripture, where it says when we don't know how to pray, then God supernaturally empowers us to pray a heavenly language. A heavenly language. That means it's beyond... Uh, I'm, I've run out of English, I've run out of Afrikaans, I have no more to say um, about the matter I'm praying for. And there's a heavenly language that God calls an intercessory language. The book of Romans chapter 8 says, when we don't know how to pray, the Spirit Himself takes hold together with us, with groanings that cannot be uttered. Now, there'd be misinterpreted where people think if they groan and all the rest of it. That's not what the Bible is saying. It's when our spirit is at a place where we don't know how to pray anymore. The Holy Spirit takes a hold together with us and we begin to pray God-directed prayers in a heavenly language. And when we begin to pray God-directed prayers, this is Romans chapter 8 from verse 24 to 28. When we begin to pray that heavenly language, the Bible says, and all things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. So before we go today, you're des desirous of receiving the Holy Spirit. The first thing, you need to make sure that your heart is pure with God, that you've forgiven everyone and your heart is pure with God. The second thing is to be able to pray and say, Heavenly Father, I thank you, I am your child. I receive your Holy Spirit by faith. I receive all the gifts of the Spirit so that I may flow in the full potential and live in the full potential of my new life in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow for communion. Have a wonderful day.